Welcome to Omron's Automating Life Sciences Tech Talk series. In this series, we cover four topics that are at the forefront of changing the way life sciences companies operate today and beyond. In this Tech Talk, traceability expert and Omron's Director of Traceability Solutions, John Agapakis, will cover the internal benefits of traceability, the external mandates and regulations, as well as why traceability is about optimizing productivity and quality by tying product to process data. Let's start by looking at the definition of traceability from Wikipedia. I think it's a great one. Traceability is the capability to trace something. In some cases, it is interpreted as the ability to verify the history, location, or application of an item by means of documented recorded identification. Other common definitions include the capability and implementation of keeping track of a given set or type of information to a given degree or the ability to chronologically interrelate uniquely identifiable entities in a way that is verifiable. Perfect. You may also see traceability applications referred to as track trace and control applications. The value proposition in such applications is enhancing productivity by capturing data. Data that allows us to tell where a part is now, track, where a part has been, trace, or where does it need to go, control. There are both internal and external traceability drivers. External drivers include regulatory compliance, industry standards, or customer-specific requirements. We will see a few of the regulations and mandates as they pertain to life sciences in a few slides, but virtually every industry today has uh, standards and requirements for uh, traceability and serialization from automotive and aerospace to food and beverage and electronics. In addition to the external drivers, there is also internal justification, good internal justification for implementing traceability for reasons such as undercutter feeding, error proofing, improving quality, but also to better address market trends such as mass customization and miniaturization. Looking now at the evolution of traceability, we probably need to start from the 1970s with the advent of barcodes and their first applications in the retail. Continuing with what we refer to as traceability 2.0, expansion of usage of barcodes in the supply chain. True traceability really begins to be implemented in industrial applications in the uh, mid-1990s and obviously in earnest in the last 20 years with introduction of unit level traceability and serialization in a variety of industries in manufacturing. Today, most recently, the uh, most enlightened users of uh, traceability are now trans begin to transition to what we refer to as traceability 4.0, where process information is also saved together with part ID and used for process optimization. Looking first at the automatic product identification and inventory tracking applications that everybody is familiar with from the supermarket or the warehouse, these uh, were enabled by 1D barcodes that were either printed on labels or directly on packages or cases. Let's look now at uh, unit level traceability, what we referred to previously as traceability 3.0 and nowadays traceability 4.0. This is what allows us to extend serialized identification to individual parts and cover what used to be a traceability hole on the production floor. Even though we may have had some level of traceability of components or parts or raw materials coming in, from suppliers, and even though we could put a license uh, tag or a serial number on a final assembly, uh, we typically had no way of knowing what components, what parts went into what assembly, and what parts or what assemblies went through what process and at what time uh, during production. This is only enabled by unit level traceability, 
attaching a serial number on every single part and every single assembly and tracking it through the production process. This is, was only enabled through the advent of the two-dimensional data matrix codes in the early to mid-1990s, which uh, can be directly marked on parts through a process that we typically refer to as DPM, direct part marking. As we will see in a moment, this is possible through the unique characteristic of the data matrix codes that they encode information digitally and as such they can be printed, marked, and read in very low contrast. In addition to closing the traceability hole on the production floor, traceability, unit level traceability, is valuable, of course, throughout the supply chain and throughout the life cycle of a part or a product. Overall objectives of traceability include part genealogy, counter prevention, reject tracking, whereby you identify and track a reject throughout multiple, through multiple steps of a process, only rejecting it in the end of the process, but while at the same time avoiding adding value along the way. Spill containment, where you limit the scope of a recall to only a parts that you know have gone through a particular process at a particular time, instead of quarantining and uh, containing a whole day's production or a whole week's production, uh, for example. Assembly error proofing, Selective pairing of components, whereby you mate components that fall in the same tolerance range, for example, or even broader process optimization and control. Overall, the key objective of uh, traceability is really to limit or eliminate rejects and recalls. Of course, it's one thing to receive in the mail a notice of recall your car's airbag, and it's another to find out the hip implant that you have implanted in your hip may fracture uh, at some point in time, but not knowing whether you are the lucky recipient of one of those defective hip implants. Now that we understand uh, some of the drivers and evolution of uh, traceability, and before we uh, jump into the standards and regulatory mandates, uh, let's uh, cover briefly uh, some of the basics of uh, barcodes and RFID. Starting with uh, 1D, conventional 1D barcodes, those are typically comprised of a unique pattern of bars and spaces with the information encoded in terms of the relative widths of those bars and spaces. There's, of course, many, many, many different types of such 1D barcodes. Everyone is, of course, familiar with the UPC codes that you can find on any product sold in retail today, globally. But in uh, industrial or lab automation applications, you will probably, uh, the most popular codes are the Interleave 205, Code 128, and Code um, 39. These evolve from um, the need for encoding more information uh, in the same space. They originally emerged as uh, 2D stacked codes that were developed by stacking, literally stacking 1D codes one on top of the other, uh, giving rise to codes such as the data bar codes that you'll see in the little labels that you find on fruit nowadays, or the PDF 417 codes that you have in the back of your driver's license. However, as uh, the need to evolve for more and more information to be encoded in less and less space, true two-dimensional codes uh, were developed with the information encoded in both directions, giving rise to codes ultimately such as the data matrix and the QR code. The data matrix code is of particular interest because as you will see later on, uh, it is actually specified by virtually all industrial standards uh, in life sciences or other industries and many other industries. 
The code was originally invented uh, in the 1990s, early 1990s, by a company called ID Matrix, which was ultimately acquired by Omer. A typical data matrix code is comprised of uh, a finder border, a solid border, an L finder pattern, pattern uh, a timing border, an intermediate black and white border on the other side of the code, and the actual body of the code that encodes the information. Um, it's, uh, it, it turns out that it has the highest information density, is scalable and readable in any orientation, has built-in error correction, and most importantly, it encodes information digitally uh, as opposed to the analog encoding in, found in 1D barcodes, and therefore allows reading of the code even uh, in very low contrast, directly marked on part. Conventional 1D barcodes encode information in an analog form uh, in terms of the widths of bars and spaces. Therefore, in order to reliably read an 1D barcode, you need to have relatively high contrast between the bars and the background, uh, which again in turn means that in order to place an 1D barcode directly on a product such as this uh, Coke can, you really need to have a clear, bright background as if uh, you actually had a label uh, on the product. On the other hand, on a data matrix, uh, the encoding of information is digital in terms of presence or absence of cells. This means that you can print and read a reliably a data matrix code, even in very low contrast. To summarize uh, the uh, key advantages of data matrix for unit level traceability applications, number one is of course the high information density, which makes it possible to mark and track uh, very small parts. You see here uh, four examples of codes, a data matrix code, a PDF 417 code, a code 128, and a code 39, all printed with the exact same printing resolution and carrying the exact same information, but obviously requiring a very different amount of space. Two, uh, data matrices uh, are scalable and can also be read in any orientation using a camera. As we just mentioned, they can uh, be read even if printed with very low contrast, therefore uh, can be marked directly on parts enabling unit level traceability of course of parts that cannot carry a label and uh, finally because of the high information density they can also include error checking and correction codes which allow you to read the uh, information encoding in the data matrix even in the face of damage such as in, in examples here whereby as much as 20 percent of the code is missing uh, but the information can be fully uh, decoded. Let's look now briefly at RFID radio frequency identification technology, which is a complementary technology to barcodes, typically involved in non line of sight identification. In RFID, uh, information is encoded electronically in a tag that is either mounted on a part or embedded uh, in a label. Those tags typically are passive, they don't have any power, uh, and both power and data are carried over an air gap as the tags are interrogated by uh, the RFID readers and writers. The distance over which a tag can be read, the size of the air gap, essentially the air interface, uh, is typically dictated by the frequency standard used this has given rise to different frequency bands used in RFID applications, low frequency, high frequency, and ultra high frequency bands uh, with correspondingly longer read ranges, corresponding regulations, global regulations, and of course applications in different industries and RFID products, readers and tags offered by many different manufacturers. Comparing 
RFID with barcodes, we should remember that those are complementary technologies used in applications in concert with one another. Barcodes will be typically used to identify individual products with the line of sight to the reader, whereas RFID tags and readers will be used to identify and track an assemblage of products, either in a container or a pallet, where there is no direct line of sight to every individual product in the assembly. Earlier work and standards by NASA and DOD provided, of course, great foundation for the FDA to introduce in the early uh, 2010s uh, standards for medical devices, pharmaceutical and food. Uh, the FDA UDI, Unique Device ID for Medical Devices, the FDA DSCSA, Drug Supply Chain Security Act for pharmaceuticals, and the FDA FSMA, Food Safety Modernization Act for food. To answer the question, why did the FDA find it necessary to introduce uh, the Unique Device ID mandate? One needs to look at the challenge that was uh, facing the medical device market uh, prior to UDI. Uh, specifically, at that time, systems allowed medical devices to be re-identified virtually at every step in the supply chain, which of course made product tracking or recall efforts extremely difficult. And to make the challenge even more clear, uh, one only needs to look at the many part numbers, item numbers, under which a single product from a single manufacturer uh, may have been present in the market, depending on uh, whether one referenced the original manufacturer part number or uh, the various part numbers under which the same product uh, may have been marketed by various vendors. Looking now at more of the specifics of the UDI mandate, the regulation requires that uh, every device needs to be identified by a unique numeric or alphanumeric code, which generally consists of two parts. One, a device identifier, a DI, which is a mandatory fixed part of the code uh, that identifies the labeler, the vendor, and the specific version of the model of the device. And two, a production identifier, a PI, which is a conditional variable portion of the code, which includes information about things such as the lot or batch number within which the device was manufactured, the serial number of the specific device, expiration date of the device, manufacturing date of the device, and other relevant uh, information stipulated by the regulation. All this information has to be provided by the device labeler, the vendor, uh, in two forms on both labels and packages incorporated or including the device. One, in easily readable, human readable, plain text, and two, machine readable form using the uh, auto ID technologies, auto ID, automatic identification and data capture technologies that we already reviewed previously, 1D or 2D barcodes, and or RFID. Both the content and the format of the information to be included in a UDI label is specified by the UDI mandate. Of course, what I'm showing here is just a mock-up of such a UDI label, but specifics can be found on the FDA website. Searching the web, you can uh, see many examples of actual UDI labels, as I'm showing here on the right. The information in these labels need to be correct, complete, and legible. The various UDI issuing agencies specify ways of checking the quality of printing of the barcodes on those labels. If the information is not correct or not legible, then both the label but also the product become unusable. So it's not an exaggeration to state, as the saying goes in the medical device industry, 
that the label is the product. In addition to labels, the UDI mandate also stipulates that permanent UDI marking uh, directly on the device is required for reusable devices such as diffusion pumps, heart monitors or ventilators, and surgical instruments. Such permanent marking can be accomplished by either direct part marking or by durable labels or data plates that can be affixed permanently on the device. However, it should be noted that the FDA did not insist on direct part marking for all implantable devices due to concerns on the effect of marking on clinical properties. Just like in the case of labeling, however, the UDI issuing agencies also specify ways for checking the quality of direct part marking on devices. The FDA has authorized certain UDI issuing agencies to hand out the unique device identifiers for medical device products and also specify the code formats and print and mark quality standards. The three organizations authorized today are GS1, the Global Standards 1, HIBIC, Health Industry Business Communications Council, and ISBT, International Society of Blood Transfusion. GS1, or Global Standards 1, uh, is the reincarnation of what used to be the EAN, European Article Numbering Association, and in the US, the UCC Uniform Code Council, which is uh, the organizations uh, that brought us the UPC codes and the read and beep to the supermarket. Today, the GS1 standards have been applied and adopted by the retail, the grocery, food service, fresh foods, and of course, healthcare industries. Uh, a valid GS1 symbol is formed by concatenating multiple data fields separated by uh, defined application identifiers that identify the purpose of the field and define the content format. Uh, some of the commonly used AIs are the GTIN, the Global Trade Identification Number that identifies the product and the device, uh, the batch or lot number, the production date, the best before date, expiration date, and serial number. Any valid GS1 symbol has to start with an FNC1 header that identifies it as such a valid symbol. The same FNC uh, separator also has to be used after any variable field lengths that are part of the uh, UDI. The FDA UDI mandate also stipulates that uh, the device labelers are also required to submit information pertaining to their devices to an FDA-administered global UDI database, uh, also known as GoodID. The good ID includes a standard set of basic identifying elements for each device with a UDI and specifically contains only the device identifier, which is the key to allow searches about the device information in the database. Overall, uh, it is really a medical device identification system that is recognized around the world uh, and which allows more accurate reporting, reviewing, and analyzing of adverse event reports. Uh, it also allows um, healthcare professionals to reduce medical errors by more rapidly and precisely being able to identify a, a device and obtain important information about it. Of course, it allows manufacturers, distributors, and healthcare facilities to more effectively manage medical device recalls. And overall, uh, provide the foundation for a global secure distribution chain that can help to address counterfeiting, diversion, and uh, also, of course, be prepared for medical emergencies. The UDI mandate was supposed to be uh, implemented on a rolling basis based on uh, device class. So the highest risk devices, class three, devices such as pacemakers, high-frequency ventilators, uh, implanted prosthetics, etc., uh, were supposed to be in compliance by September of 2014. Class 2 medium-risk devices such as catheters, syringes, uh, blood transfusion kits, uh, surgical gloves, etc., 
were supposed to be in compliance by September of 2016. Uh, and finally, class one devices, the lowest risk devices, such as toothbrushes, electric toothbrushes, oxygen masks, uh, bandages, hospital beds, etc., were supposed to be in compliance by September of 2018. Directly marked devices of each class were supposed to be in compliance two years later for the corresponding labeled devices of the same class, uh, which would bring essentially DPM class one devices that needed to be in compliance by this September of 2020. Over the last two years, however, uh, the FDA has uh, extended some of those deadlines, which essentially bring now uh, the deadline for compliance of class one devices to September of this year, September 2020, and DPM class one devices uh, to September 2022. The FDA UDI mandate also applies to clinical diagnostics reagents. These are the chemicals that are used in a variety of clinical diagnostics instruments, such as hematology analyzers, chemistry analyzers, immunoassay analyzers. Depending on the uh, specific application, uh, different reagents fall into different device classes uh, per the earlier discussion. Clinical diagnostics instrumentation is also subject to additional standards and regulations, uh, such as, for example, those developed by the Clinical Laboratory Standards Institute, CLSI. Probably the most relevant to our discussion of those standards is CLSI Auto 2 standard, the second edition of which uh, was published on December of 2005 and regulates uh, the use of uh, an application of barcodes on or barcodes on labels placed on specimen tubes. To demonstrate the uh, importance of understanding those relevant standards, I wanted to point to section 6.4.1 of this standard, which in uh, just four lines allowed overnight, uh, sometime in the summer of 2009, hospitals to put more information on their barcodes on specimen tubes, and therefore need to use higher density barcodes, which in turn uh, drove the requirement by the clinical diagnostics instrumentation industry for high resolution imagers for barcode reading. Just like the uh, UDI mandate, uh, DSCSA also is supposed to be implemented on a rolling basis. At this point in time, where we stand in 2020, uh, all pharmaceuticals in the US market uh, are supposed to be individually serialized uh, with the completion of uh, the whole program in 2023. DSCSA also specifies labeling requirements for all pharmaceutical products. And just like the UDI codes, a single product identifier has to be created and uh, be present on every label uh, in both human readable and machine readable form, either as in 1D or a 2D code. This product identifier is actually composed of a GTIN number a product's unique serial number, product expiration date, and a product lot number. Uh, maybe the one difference from UID, UDI is that uh, GTIN incorporates uh, something called the National Drug Code that uniquely identifies every pharmaceutical product in the market, and it's itself composed of three uh, segments, a label ID that is assigned by the FDA, and then a product and trade package size ID that is defined by uh, the labeler themselves. The Drug Supply Chain Security Act uh, is far from being uh, unique around the world. As a matter of fact, uh, virtually all uh, major countries around the world have already implemented uh, some type of serialization mandates for their pharmaceutical industries, uh, as you can see in this uh, world map uh, showing some of those initiatives as of a couple of years ago. The Drug Supply Chain Security Act, DSCSA, and uh, similar serialization mandates around the world have driven even more extensive use of barcodes uh, and barcode reading 
uh, by the pharmaceutical industry, both pharmaceutical companies themselves, as well as contract packagers. Uh, as an example of a solution specifically developed for this application, a pharmaceutical serialization, I'm showing in this slide a 360 degree reading solution, whereby six or up to eight readers, uh, barcode readers, are networked in an Ethernet network and uh, configured in a master slave parent child arrangement, whereby a single trigger will activate all of them and uh, whichever of those uh, readers is able to read the barcode that may be oriented arbitrarily on a bottle coming down the conveyor line will be passed back through the master and out communicated to the uh, line controller. You can find a nice article on the importance of traceability in uh, the October 2019 issue of Forbes magazine, uh, in which the uh, CEO of Zollner Electronics is quoted as saying, if you're not investing in new technologies like traceability, you won't exist much longer. And that wraps our first Tech Talk. We invite you to listen on demand to the other three Tech Talks in our Automating Life Sciences series.